So good. Well, Lord, we just want to thank you so much, Father, for, um, for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. And, and we just give you all the thanks and the, the, the praise for that this morning. And, and I ask, Lord, that, Father, as we open your word this morning, that you'd give us eyes to see and ears to hear what it is that your Spirit is saying to the church. And we just uh, thank you so much, Lord, for these awesome times that we live in. And uh, I pray, Lord, this morning that you would build us up, that you would fill us up, Lord, that, Father, that we would, um, that we would be launched into this week, Lord, to tackle whatever uh, challenge it is that lies before us, Lord. But that uh, we thank you that we don't face it alone, Lord, but that we have you with us, that your word says you'll never leave us nor forsake us that you're always, uh, always with us, Lord, wherever we go. And so, God, we want to thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. And they all said, amen, amen. amen. I was actually reading a, um, a story about this guy this week. And, um, and anyway, he, uh, he decided to go to the gym and, uh, and work out with his personal trainer. And so he's at the gym and he's, he's working out with his personal trainer and this this lovely young lady walks into the gym and uh, he turns to his personal trainer and he's like, what should, what should I do to impress her? What machine should I use to impress her? And, uh, and the personal trainer says, try the ATM in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That's pretty... F I need to get a few new ones. I haven't used that for a little while. But I just felt like we needed something just to get in the flow this morning. Amen. Come on, it's so good to, uh, to have you all here. I was going to start whipping a few mother-in-law ones out, but maybe we can leave that till next week um, because uh, we've got people in the room, so <laughs> praise God. It is so awesome, um, awesome to be here today. If you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to turn to Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, and um, I really believe that, um, that there's some... Um, things in this um, in this in this book in this chapter for us as we um, are, are moving uh, forward into everything that God has for us is um, is this week something really significant happened? Is we actually crossed over uh, into the the Jewish New Year and not to get too um, carried away with it, but um, but we've actually uh, gone from 5784 into 5785, which is um, which, as we know, is for us, is we celebrate the beginning of the new year on January the 1st, and we finish the year on uh, December the 31st. But, but on the Jewish calendar, it's actually around the September-October period of the year, where it's the beginning of the Jewish new year. And, um, and, and, and I never really recognized the significance of it for a, a while, but I'd have to say over the last 12 years or so, um, is that I've actually become aware that this is a time where the Lord has actually been really instrumental in actually setting up and putting in motion some of the things that are going to take place in the, in the following 12 um, months. So we've come out of 5784. I said last week is, is that in Hebrew is each number actually has a, a picture that represents the number, a symbol that represents the number. And so 5784, the four in Hebrew, the number four actually looks like a tent door or an open, open tent door. And so we've actually, we're stepping out of the year of the open door, but we're actually moving into 5785, which this is the year where God is redeeming lost time. And I want to say to you here this morning, if you feel like there's been delay in your life, if you feel like there's been things that uh, haven't happened how you thought that it should happen, I'd encourage you to actually press in because this is a year, I believe, the Lord is redeeming the time and He's restoring things. I've actually been meditating on, uh, on the, uh, the story of David in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, it talks about David at Ziklag. And so David's actually out fighting. He's got these men with him. If you're familiar with the Bible, King David um, is a really you know, instrumental figure in the Bible. And so David's out and he's fighting with the Philistines. 
and he gets back to the camp with his men and they realize that the Amalekites have come and they've, they've stolen their wives, they've taken their wives, they've taken their children, they've taken all their money, they've taken everything that they have and, 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 um, and they get back to the camp and everything's missing. And you can imagine what it would have been like. Everything's been taken from them. And to make it worse is the guys that were with David, they said, man, let's stone this guy. You know, he was at absolute rock bottom, you know, in, in his life. And, um, but, but the Bible says this thing that is so important. It says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. Is he strengthened himself in the Lord? And he says, we're going to get up. And we're going to go back and we're going to recover everything that the enemy stole from us. And he goes and he takes back all of their wives. They get back all of their children. They get back all of the, you know, the resources and everything that was stolen from them, plus a whole lot more. It reminds me of this old song, you know, we used to sing, but it goes like this is, I went to the enemy's camp. And I uh, took back what he stole from me. Obviously, you don't know. You know this one? Some really old people do. No. <laughs> I went. Anyway, I believe this is a year where we're going to go to the enemy's camp and take back everything that he's stolen from us. And whatever that is, whether it's relationships, whether he's stolen your peace, whatever he's stolen, this is a year, I believe, to actually recover all. But this morning, I actually really want to talk about the power of prayer. I really want to talk about the power of prayer this morning because I really believe that we're coming in to a season of, of actually occupying every assignment, every space and every place that God has for us to occupy. In Luke chapter 19 uh, verse 10, Luke 19 verse 10 is Jesus actually is talking about the parable of the talents and he says that to every person, he gives different giftings and different talents and different abilities. And so Jesus gives these different talents, different giftings, different abilities. And he says this thing. He says, I'm giving it to you, but I want you to occupy until I come. Come on. That, that doesn't mean that we just sit in the corner and mope. Come on doesn't mean we just hide under a rock. It means that we occupy every space, place, assignment, gifting, and calling that is, that is he's calling us into. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk about occupying the prayer closet, because I want to suggest is before anything happens in the earth, is it's all a product of us declaring, speaking, and praying. We know in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning, God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. And, and, and from there, we read about the creation story, everything come from there, but there's power in actually speaking. But the reason it's important for us to pray is because we must understand the fundamental principle is there are two kingdoms that are operating in the earth. Amen. T two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Satan. <laughs> there's the satanic kingdom and there's the kingdom of God. There's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And so we obviously know there's lots of different nations around the world and lots of different things. But fundamentally, everything boils down to the fact that there are two kingdoms. And the question is, is what kingdom do you find yourself in this morning? Is I, I know I've done you know fencing before and I've fenced up paddocks, but but you know one thing that I've noticed is is that if you decide to stand in a fence with an electric fence between your crotch, you know, with one foot on one side of the fence and one foot on the other side of the fence, it doesn't end well. It's it's either you are fully in this paddock, come on, or you're fully in this paddock. Because people say, oh, well, I want, I want a little bit of God. I want a little bit of Jesus. I want to be in the kingdom of God, but I also want to dabble in the world. Well, I'll tell you here today is that you might think you can sit on the fence, but the devil owns the fence. There really is only two options. It's either I'm going to serve Jesus, I'm going to find myself planted and rooted in the kingdom of God, or I'm going to find myself in the kingdom of darkness. 
And every single one of us have that choice to make. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, I think at the end of that chapter, is it goes on and it says this, it says, when God speaks, it shakes the earth and everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that we can receive a kingdom that's unshakable. What's that implying? It's actually implying that these shakings come so we realize what is the foundation of our life? Where are we standing in our life? Am I fully planted in the kingdom of God? Am I living according to His ways and His statutes? Or do I find myself in the kingdom of darkness? And so when we pray, we need to understand is that everything, and this is important, everything that happens in the natural realm is a byproduct of what happens in the spiritual realm. Everything that you see happening around you is either under the influence of the kingdom of God or under the kingdom of the enemy. And so why do we pray? Is because when we pray, is, is that there's, a, there's an amazing verse in the Bible that says this, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways, they'll humble themselves and pray, is I will hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. It's because when we pray, we actually activate heaven's forces. And there, there are angels that are waiting to respond to your prayers. And, it's, and, and in, in James, we're going to get to that a bit later on, but James says this, is, is that the, the, the prayers of a righteous man avail much. So when you pray into a situation, when you pray and you say, God, I need you to move in this situation, I need you to move in this circumstance, you're not praying empty-handed, you're praying with the full backing of the kingdom of God behind you. Is is that we are, we are not just merely living in a natural realm, is, is that we are a part, we're living in the natural, but what we see in the natural is significantly influenced by the spiritual realm, and that's why we have to pray. And so this morning, I want to talk about uh, the power of prayer. But let's get to Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4 here together. So this is actually, we're picking up on a story. As we know is, is that the children of Israel, they've been in Babylon and the last couple of weeks we've been talking about breaking ties with Egypt. Does anyone remember that? We've been talking about breaking ties with Egypt. And so just so you don't feel bad is that if you've organized a, you know, a, a trip to go to Egypt and have a look at the pyramids and maybe, you know, a culinary, you know, tour through, through Cairo, that's fine. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to stop that. We're actually talking about breaking ties with slavery and breaking ties with anxiety and breaking ties with fear and breaking ties with depression. Come on, because the Bible says is that Jesus come to set the captives free. Amen. So that's what we're talking about when we um, are talking about breaking ties with Egypt. But let's read Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1. It says here, so that the Israelites have gone back into their land and they're beginning to occupy the land that God has called them to occupy. And it says here, 4 verse 1, When Sambalat heard that they were angry, that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. And he ridiculed the Jews in the presence of his associates and in the army of Samaria. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Notice here how Sambalat, he's, like, he's heard that there are some people that are actually doing stuff, and he gets angry. <laughs> One of the things, you know, that, that I've noticed in life is, is that if you don't do anything, the enemy doesn't really care because you're doing nothing. <laughs> but if you actually begin to start doing something, if you actually start to begin to do the calling, the assignment, the thing that God has placed on your life, you can expect opposition. But don't be, uh, don't be uh, you know, put off by that because even though there's opposition, there's great support. There's angelic support. There is support from fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. Come on, we're on the winning team. Is Jesus came and he disarmed and defeated the enemy and then he says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we're on the winning side. But expect, if you're called to do great things, there's going to be opposition. But, that, but that's fine. Actually, we should be encouraged by it. 
It's like, man, the, the more stuff that's coming against us, that's a good thing because it must mean that we're actually taking ground and doing stuff that we're, we're meant to be doing. But let's keep reading here. And it says, will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah the Amorite, who was at his side, said what they are building, even if a, flo- a fox climbs up on it, would break their wall down with stones. Verse 4, it says, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads and give them over to plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insights in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall, all of it, till it reached half of its height. For the people worked with all their heart, but when Sambalat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Amorites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Come on, why don't you say very angry? Very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, to stir up trouble against it. But this is really important here in in verse 9. It says, but we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. What I really want to stir up here this morning is the power of prayer. Because is that if we don't occupy the prayer room, then we're not going to occupy anything else. Everything begins by occupying a place of prayer is in uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Why don't we just go there for a bit, but um, it's important in talking about prayer to actually read the Lord's Prayer. This is what Jesus himself had to say about prayer. And so Jesus says here in Matthew 6 verse 9, it says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have also forgiven our debitors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will will not forgive you of your sins. So you could actually break this prayer down into two sections. In verse 9 and 10, it's very much directional. It's directional prayer. And, and, and in, the, in the second part of the, of, the, um, of, of the prayer, it's actually protectional. But it reminded me, you know, this, this week actually I've been, um, uh, I've been listening to this guy uh, called Rees Howes in an audio book. And Rees Howes was actually an intercessor, and so an intercessor is somebody that prays. And during World War II, as Rees Howes actually began to start praying for, for the war, and he'd hear on the radio about what was happening in um, different battles, whether it was the, the invasion at Normandy or whether it was um, the Battle of Dunkirk or all of these different battles that were happening throughout World War II. And what would actually happen is um, they didn't expect this to happen, but he was running a ministry college and the Lord really impressed on them that they needed to start praying for the war. And they needed to start praying specifically into these battles. And it was as if they had this real burden would come on them to pray. And it was like, man, we have to pray for the outcome of this. And, and what they noticed is, is that they would start praying and they would pray and they would pray. And when we talk about prayer, we're just talking about communication with God but, but it's when we pray, things really begin to happen. And so they would pray and pray and pray, and then sometimes they'd pray all the way through the night. And it was like that they'd pray and they'd pray, but then they felt the burden lift. And, and they knew that when the burden had lifted, that they had broken through in prayer, and that heaven had heard their prayers. 
and then they'd go to sleep and, and they'd continue to pray for things, but then a few days later they'd actually find out that the allies were actually successful in this battle and they knew that it wasn't just something that had been won in the natural. It wasn't just a battle that had been won in the natural. It was a battle that had first been won in the prayer room. And I encourage you this morning, whatever you might be facing, whatever obstacle, whatever difficulty, is we win the fight first in the spiritual. We win the fight in the prayer room. And when we win the fight in the prayer room, is we see the battles won in the natural. Amen. You might be thinking, oh man, I, you know, I didn't know it was all like this, but um, we're going to try and keep it very biblically based. All right, so it says here, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is Jesus himself is teaching us how to pray. And this is actually a directional prayer. And so what's Jesus saying here? He's saying, pray this way, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You could say, well, what is the will of God? <laughs> it actually it includes it in this prayer. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is that meaning? It is actually the will of God to see what is happening in heaven break through into the realm of the earth <clears throat> to become manifest here. So, for instance, is as if you think about heaven, you know, heaven uh, is, you know, when we die, we go to be with the Lord, we go to be in heaven, but we don't often think about heaven is a reality that we can see made manifest here. In heaven, there's no sickness. In heaven, there's no disease. In heaven, there's no anxiety. In heaven, there's no depression. In heaven, there's no lack. In, in, in heaven, we find none of these things. So what do we pray? We know we're praying the will of God and we're actually praying the Lord's Prayer. When we see anxiety and we pray peace into that situation, we are praying a prayer that is realizing the reality of heaven and we're imposing that on what's happening on earth. Amen. So, so, so we're, we're praying directional prayers. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on the earth as it is in heaven. So anything that you see happening in uh, your life that's like, man, this isn't lining up with what heaven would be saying or with what heaven would be doing. You actually have the authority to pray for that thing to move and it shall be moved. Are you with me? So we pray directional prayers. You know, sometimes I think we actually pray prayers that, that, that God can't actually answer because it actually violates His law. Um, but we don't, I don't want to get too deep into that here today. For instance, a, you know, a, um, you know a, a, a prayer, I haven't even really thought of it, I'm kind of just on the spot here. But, um, but if you know, say, pray to prayer and you're like, oh God, if it be your will that I'm healed, maybe if it's your will I'm healed, then I could be healed. It's actually not a prayer that he can answer because we know it's his will to heal. Every person that come to Jesus was healed. Now, sometimes we, we, we don't experience everything and we have questions why things don't go how we think they should go. However, we need to understand his will so that we can pray directional prayers that are in alignment with heaven. Now we go over the page here and it says, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts if we have also forgiven our debitors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is a protectional prayer because whenever you step out and you begin to start really doing things with the Lord and doing things for the Lord, is it's not only important to pray directionally, but it's important to pray for protection. I actually think sometimes is, is that in our lives, we experience warfare that we actually don't have to experience simply because of a lack of prayer. Does that make sense? As he says here, lead us not into temptation. Why is he getting to, us to pray this? He's getting us to pray this because he actually wants to not lead us into temptation. <laughs> And so when we pray this, it's actually like this protection that happens. We say, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And then in verse 14, this is very important. It says, for if you forgive one another, 
people, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Isn't this full on? He's actually saying here is, is that, and, and by the way, we love children here so much, honestly. I was going to say it every week. We love children. We've got a little fella here. They can cry and vomit and do whatever. It's, we just love it all. Um, but the, th- the thing is here is he's saying is, is that if we don't forgive others, God can't forgive you. It's pretty serious business, hey? You know, one of the things that I think that we need to understand, I think there's issues that we face in our nation and there's issues that, that people face all the time, but there's this tendency we have to hold on to unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. It's like, man, what you did to me, that wasn't right. Man, and, and, then, and, and then we have this idea, we think, well, if I hold a grudge, if I don't forgive them, then I'm going to keep them on the hook. Has anyone ever thought that before? It's like, I'm not going to forgive that person because if I forgive them, I'm going to let them go and then that validates what they did to me. But the issue is, is, is that while you think that you're keeping them on the hook, is Satan actually keeps you on the hook. I love what Joyce Meyer says, but she says this, as she says, is, is unforgiveness, unforgiveness in your life is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die is forgiving is hard, man. Forgiving is a difficult thing, and sometimes we can have this unforgiveness that can stem back, well, well, your dad treated my dad the wrong way, or blah, 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 and this stuff can go back generations. But it's not until we forgive that we open ourselves up for the forgiving nature of God to actually come and to forgive us. Amen. And so for some people, maybe it is, is that in prayer, it is, is, that, is, is that you need to realize, is there some people that I need to forgive? Is the reason I'm not breaking through in prayer, is it because I need to forgive somebody? Is there a blockage there in the area of forgiveness that I need to um, forgive someone? In Daniel chapter 10, we actually see this powerful picture of, of what happens in the spiritual realm when we pray. We're going to have the verses up on the, up on the screen here. But in Daniel chapter 10, the Bible says is, is that God gives Daniel a dream. And Daniel has a dream about this event that's going to be happening in the future. And so, um, so he has this dream and, and he's like, man, I need, to, I need to gain understanding. I need to gain wisdom. And the Bible says is Daniel begins to pray. And the moment that Daniel begins to pray, it says a messenger from heaven was actually released to bring the answer that Daniel was praying for. And so anyway, he prays and he prays, but, but, but he, he doesn't get an answer. And the Bible says is Daniel prays and he fasts for 21 days. So you think about that, you know, day 18, day 19, you know, we're, we're day five minutes and we're giving up. Come on. <laughs> But, but his day 18, he's praying, day 19, he's praying and he's fasting, day 20, he's praying and he's fasting, but it's not until the 21st day of praying and fasting. The Bible actually says is that Michael the archangel come and help the messenger break through to bring the answer to Daniel's prayer. What am I saying is, is don't give up if you're praying for something. Don't give up until you see the breakthrough because we can, we can be so, we, we live live in a culture where everything is macaroni, cheese, microwave, shake and bake, you know, we ring up dominoes on speed dial, all this sort of stuff. We want instantaneous breakthrough, but sometimes it actually requires us to stay in faith and say, God, I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray until the answer comes. Now, sometimes when you're praying, it's like the Lord will be like, you know, he'll give you an open door. Or it'll be like a green light. I don't know whether anyone's prayed for something. Maybe it's you, you know, you're praying, God, who should I marry? Should I ask this person out? Or, you know, or, or God, is this where you would have me go? Is this the direction you'd have me go? Wh- whatever that might be. And sometimes when you're praying, God will give you a green light. And, 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 and it comes in, you know, yeah, this is what God has for me. But then sometimes you'll get a red light or a closed door. And and prayer will actually lead to God closing a door rather than opening a door. And I've actually become like really grateful for the closed doors in my life because God's actually spoken to me more through closed doors than he has through open doors. 
But the difficult thing is, is that when we get an orange light, <laughs> and it's like sometimes God's like, it's not a red light, it's not a green light, but it's an orange light. And the Lord's actually saying, I want you to wait on me. And often when He's calling you to, 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 to wait on Him, He's actually in, inviting you to come into a time of prayer. And often it, it, it might be because the thing you're praying for, the person isn't ready yet. The thing you're praying for, the opportunity isn't ready yet. The thing you're praying for, things haven't come into place for that to happen yet, but you continue to pray. We need to continue to keep praying. And, and, and this here, uh, honestly, I, I, could just, you know, I could go so many directions, but when we get an orange light, is it doesn't mean that God hasn't answered, it's that He's inviting us into a relational journey with Him. And, and, and you'll notice how sometimes there's something you might be praying for and you have a burden. And I don't know whether you've experienced before, but there's been times where, whether it was when I was waiting for my beautiful wife or, or whatever, you know, whatever it is, but there's times where it's like, man, I need to pray for this right now. And you pray and the burden lifted. God didn't open a door. She didn't, bing, pop up. You know what I'm saying? But I knew that I'd done what I needed to do in prayer because the burden had lifted and the door certainly hadn't closed. Praise the Lord. So we need to be sensitive to actually knowing is, is that God actually wants us to partner with Him in prayer because when we're praying, we're actually praying, God, would, 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 would you see the perfect will of God be made true in my life? And, and, and if you aren't seeing what you're believing for, keep praying because God is hearing. And we don't always understand why God hasn't answered, but we can know this is heaven has responded. And sometimes God won't answer you how you think that you want him to answer, but he'll give you a perspective to what you're praying for that shifts you into the right place. So now you can see things through fresh eyes. Are you with me? It is we're talking this morning about the power of prayer. Prayer is powerful. I, I actually believe that prayer precedes revival. Come on. I, I, I really, why don't you come and jump on? Is there if you jump on the keys, Naomi? We might just have a time of just, um, just actually praying in, in a moment. If there's something that you're really praying for or something you're really believing for, um, the Bible says this is my father's house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. One of the things that's so beautiful about when we gather is we have the opportunity to pray for whatever it is that we, we might be coming up against, whatever it is that we might be facing. And so if there is something that you, you need prayer for today, I want you to know this is that you can bring your petitions before God and he desires to listen to you. He desires to hear you, but he doesn't just desire to listen he wants to speak because prayer is a two-way conversation it's not just a one-way conversation it's a two-way conversation in James chapter 5 verse 13 um, through to 20 Peter James John I said it says this here it says in James 5 13 it says if anyone among you is in trouble let them Pray. Come on, somebody knows it. <laughs> if anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sit? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Isn't that an awesome promise? Is, and another thing on this too, I know last week I said that we're appointing two new elders in our church. Uh, one of them, he's, he's away today. So we've actually put it back to next week. So next week we're actually going to be appointing two, two new elders um, and honoring two others that have done an amazing job. But this is what it says. It says, uh, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. We've heard testimonies of this today. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, this is the bit I wanted to get to. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Some translations actually say, I don't know whether we've oh, we got the NIV up there. Some translations actually say this. Is, is that the persistent prayer of a righteous person avails much. 
Isn't that awesome? The persistent, it's not talking about just a, you know, sometimes we can just have a nice little prayer and, 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 and it can do the job. But then other times we need to be persistent in prayer. Come on. We need, it. we need to be faithful in prayer because it is the faithful prayers of a righteous man or woman <laughs> that avails much. Amen. You guys getting this morning that prayer is powerful. And and, and there's a whole lot of stuff that I've had stirred on my heart to share in the next couple of weeks. But everything starts with prayer. And I tell you, if we start devoting ourselves to actually praying, not, you know, the Muslims, you know, they force them to do it, you know, five times a day and we're not in that sort of thing. But I'm telling you is is that prayer is a powerful thing. And And the persistent prayers of a righteous person avail much. Come on. In Acts chapter 2, we actually read this as believe it or not, is the church didn't start with a nice, well orchestrated, planned out meeting. You know, where they, they get together and they say, here's our, here's our dot points. This is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to build the church. This is how we're going to grow the church. This is our strategy. This is how we're going to do it. Is in fact, the church was actually birthed out of a prayer meeting. It was birthed in a prayer meeting. And so if the church was birthed in a prayer meeting, is the church will be sustained through a prayer meeting. And I'm telling you, if you'll actually start praying and really inviting the Lord into whatever situation it is, you'll actually start seeing God breaking out and doing stuff all over the place that you just can't even explain. I'm telling you, if we'll ramp up prayer, is we'll start seeing things happen, seeing things shift, seeing things move that we thought were impossible because there's power in prayer. So we've talked about intercessory prayer. We've talked about conversational prayer. In Acts chapter 2 verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost had came, they were all together in one place and suddenly the sound of a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire came and rested on each one of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this is, I just want to touch on this briefly. It's important that we become acquainted with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit is as much God as the Father is understand this the holy spirit is as much god as jesus is it's the father son and holy spirit that that actually make up the trinity we actually have this beautiful privilege of having the holy spirit here with us today is the holy spirit is when jesus left is he left us this beautiful holy spirit that's here with us, that that wants to lead us, who wants to guide us. And it says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to pray in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language uh, being spoken. And it goes through all of the different areas that people had come from all over the place um, in this picture. But it's says here in verse 13 it says some of them however made fun of them and said they've had too much wine but then Peter gets up and he addresses the crowd in verse 14 he says then Peter stood up with the 11 raised his voice and he addressed the crowd fellow Jews and all of those who live in Jerusalem let me explain to you listen carefully to what I say these people are not drunk as you suppose it's only nine o'clock in the morning who knows they obviously didn't get drunk at nine o'clock in the morning The Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, not be filled with wine. Amen. So it still means that, you know, there's a level of intoxication that happens when you're filled with the Spirit. (laughs) But anyway, Tyler knows about the liquid love of God. Amen. Man, when the liquid love of God comes into your life, it changes everything. And then he says here in verse 16, and we're closing up very, very soon. Know this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. It says, In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above. What am I saying here this morning? I'm saying is that we actually have received this beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit. 
we actually it's actually I would say one of the the most immense privileges of getting to walk with the Lord is is that we get to be a vessel of the Holy Spirit and we see here in the book of Acts and we can read through Corinthians and Ephesians you know is um is that one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is they began to pray in the Spirit. They began to pray in tongues. They began to pray in other languages. A lot of people have, you know, have said, you know, that's, that's, that's crazy. It doesn't make sense. You know, well, we believe in a virgin birth. Come on. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we, we, we believe that God created the world, you know. Amen. That he made it, you know, it takes faith. But it says here the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit was they began to pray in tongues. Praying tongues is actually one of the most powerful, effective weapons that I believe that we have as as Christians. Is when we pray in English, it's powerful. But when we pray in English, is often we pray out of our own intellect, our own understanding, and from our own viewpoint. But when we pray in tongues, it's actually the Holy Spirit in us actually begins to start crying out to the Father in heaven and actually beginning, when when you actually pray in tongues, you actually are praying the perfect will of God because because sometimes our carnal thinking can get in the way and we can pray prayers that are, you know, that are our agenda or what we want to pray or what we think. But when we pray in the Spirit, is we are praying the perfect will of God. And it actually allows the Holy Spirit in us to connect directly to the Spirit of God. You know, there's some, uh, you know, some Christians, um, you know, it, it's, it's like we can become stuck in a rut. Has anyone ever, ever felt like you're stuck in a rut? You know, it's like if you're stuck in a rut, it feels like a coffin with the ends kicked out. It's like, man, I'm just going nowhere. You know, things, things are horrible. But you know, one of the quickest ways to get yourself out of a rut of your own thinking and to renew your mind with the mind of Christ and the mind of God is actually praying in the Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit. Because when we pray in the Holy Spirit, it actually aligns us with the perfect will of God. So why don't you stand this morning? And I'd just love to pray here today. But I would love for each one of us, actually, just over the next couple minutes, if there's something in your life that you're like, man, I need to pray for this thing. It might be like, man, there's this situation I'm facing. There's this anxiety that I'm facing. What, what, Whatever it is that you're going through. I'd encourage you just in these next moments to actually ask the Lord. Say, Lord, would you intervene in my circumstance? Would you intervene in my situation? I just encourage you just to lift up a, a prayer, whatever it is. It may be praying for our nation. It may be praying for the nation of Australia. It might be praying for the uh, for the state of Tasmania, for our for our leaders, for Jeremy Rockliffe, Anthony Albanese, all of these people. Whether you agree with them or not, we still we're, we're instructed to pray for them. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's praying. There's a, you know you're you're waiting on the right spouse to come into your life. You're waiting for the right husband, wife. You're waiting for a job opportunity to open up. You're waiting on direction. Is that encourage you this morning? Is is that the 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 the, the consistent prayers of a righteous person avail much. So if, if you want to do that, and, and if, if, if you're like, man, I, I would love to actually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Matt, this, this thing that you're talking about, that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, I don't feel that I have that. Because I'd love to actually pray for you this morning. But I encourage you just in the next few moments where you are, just begin to lay it out before God because God, He hears from heaven. Don't be discouraged if there's a lack of breakthrough. Because I want to tell you is, is that if, 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 there, if there were just 50 people that would actually give themselves to start praying for the lost, praying for the broken, praying for the depressed, that those on, on, on pills, on who knows what, is we would see a revival begin to sweep across this town and sweep across this state and sweep across this nation. But it all begins 
with a praying church. So Lord, I want to thank you, Father, this morning. Lord, for everything that you're doing. Lord, I ask that you would come and that you would intervene, Lord, into the affair, every issue that we face. Lord, I pray, Lord, for the leaders of our country, Lord. Pray, Father, for Anthony Albanese, Lord. I pray, Lord, for Jeremy Rockliffe, Lord. We pray, Lord, for these leaders. We lift them up before you, Lord. I pray that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them insight, that you would give them knowledge, Lord. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would stir up, Lord, stir up the prayer life. Lord, stir it up, Lord. I pray that you would give us, Lord, even this morning, that you would give us a burden to pray because we know that there is a God in heaven who hears our prayers, who doesn't sit there and, and, and disregard it, Lord, but that you're a good Father. You desire to hear the prayers of your children. And so, Lord, I ask this morning that, Lord, that you would open up the heavens, that, Father, that you would re-inject a faith on the inside of each other, uh, Lord, each one of us, Lord, to pray, that we would pray without ceasing, Lord. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, and I even pray right now, Lord, for those in the room that would just love to have a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. And maybe just while every eye is closed here this morning, if you're here today and you're like, man, I just need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. I just need a fresh douse. I need a fresh touch of that fire that I just don't have. I just encourage you just to, to, to raise your hand and I'd love to pray for you specifically. No one else will see it. I'm just doing this. The Bible says, if you acknowledge me uh, before, uh, uh, before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father. So we just thank you for that, Lord. I just see people. I just want a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Why don't you just pray this prayer? If that was you, why don't you just pray this prayer? Holy Spirit, would you come? And would you fill me afresh this morning? I want to be infused with power from on high. Holy Spirit, I want to be flooding with the fruit of the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. If there's a, if there's a, a, a prayer that is on your tongue now, I'd encourage you just to pray it out. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Just pour out your spirit, Lord. We just thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. You're just unlocking, Lord, new prayer languages this morning. for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit this morning. Just pray for them. Pray that they would be filled, that they'd be injected with a fresh faith. We just praise you, Lord, this morning for everything you're doing. Pour out your 